Today's video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Ladies and gentlemen, ExpressVPN is one of those services that I always love to use, especially when I'm watching content that's geo-restricted, content that's locked away from me, especially when it comes to streaming services. And the way any of these geographical restrictions are lifted is by changing your location through ExpressVPN's vast array of massive locations in their data centers. So you can pick really whichever country you want to go into, such as Canada, the United States, or the United Kingdom. But ExpressVPN is one of those services that I've always recommend because when it comes to VPN services most are not reliable you have to look at some that are away from places where they don't have to retain data logs and when it comes to ExpressVPN's case I'm a huge fan of RAM based servers when it comes to running servers especially in VPN lands a lot of people still use traditional hard drives which leaves caches but by running your servers entirely in RAM, all you have to do is power off, kill whatever's inside, and you can use all of these things with total anonymity and privacy. And if you want to find out how to achieve the same level of anonymity and privacy, well, you can go over to expressvpn.com SOG and get three months for free just by using the link in our description. So again, head over to expressvpn.com SOG and find out how you can join the world of private and safe browsing for three months all for free. Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and Ted the Caver. Ladies and gentlemen, when I first started out my channel, it was all about creepypastas. I made a series called Haunted Gaming, and then it became just creepypastas, because to be real with you, one of the most intriguing parts about the internet to me has always been the creepy things on it, alright? And we've covered a fair bit of creepy stuff on this website. For instance, one of my personal favorites was the Alex from Tennessee thread. You know, I'm a huge fan of urban exploration creepy myths. Now, today's video comes at you all the way back from 2001. Now back in the day there was a site known as Angel Fire. Angel Fire is actually a service that's still actually available, owned by a service known as Lycos, and also Tripod.com. If you go to Angel Fire right now, you can literally make a professional website and build it. If you wanted to make a 90s adjacent looking website, this is pretty much where you're at. Now of course, amongst this lies one of the oldest websites ever created. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Ted the Caver. Back on March 23rd, 2001, Ted's Caving Journal was brought to the forefront, and this is a page that's still up to this day. Updated 51901. Now, the reason why this is really important is Ted the Caver is effectively the internet's first creepypasta, or at least one of the very first ones that was ever publicly available. Now, of course, this journal is interesting because if you read the story, it's all about the fear of the unknown. It features two characters who go into a cave and explore it, and eventually the story ends with no actual ending. The reason why it's a creepypasta is for the longest time, everyone has sat down wondering just what happened to Ted. Is Ted dead? Did Ted go to an alternate dimension? Hopefully we can find some of those answers towards the end of the video. But for now, let's jump into the page of Ted. Now, of course, the first image is looking at this interesting cave. Click here. So, of course, let's follow the thing. 32301. Due to the overwhelming number of requests I have received to tell about my discoveries and bizarre experiences in a cave not far from my house, I have created this webpage. In Ted's case, he talks a lot about the cave, but also provides some images as well, which really adds the extra fear to this creepypasta. Now, of course, the first thing that Ted wants to point out are four points. One of them, most of the pictures were taken with a Kodak disposable type camera. I took a better camera into the cave one or two of the trips. Pictures on the site are all original photos and have not been messed with or enhanced. So, of course, ladies and gentlemen, what Ted's referring to is way back in the day, we had film cameras, Kodak cameras disposable cameras you would take photos of, take the film out, and then basically process it someday down the road. Of course, nowadays, with modern-day smartphones, we don't really have to worry because most of us have DSLR-quality cameras on the go at this point. Number two, I will not reveal the name of any other persons involved in this experience. If you know me well enough, you probably know them already. Number three, I will not reveal the location of the cave to anyone for any reason, so please don't ask. If you think these events sound far-fetched, I agree. I would not have come to the same conclusion. So of course, let's go on to the next page. There's 10 in total, so let's go to page two, the discovery. So of course, Ted's got two different colors. As he explains, number one, the gray, is taken from the caving journal, and the blue is effectively Ted's reflection. B and I decided to get in one more caving trip before the new year, so we set our sights on Mystery Cave. Not a spectacular cave, but since neither of us have been caving in a while, it would be nice to go to any cave. There was a bit of excitement to this trip. There was a small passage in the lower portion of the cave that I wanted to check out to see if it was possible to get past it, and it had a small opening. 
So of course, what he's talking about is this first image right here. This little cave entrance. So of course, that's Ted's glove going through that little tiny piece. So of course, you might be wondering, how does one get through such a small hole? I used my backup mini mag light and held it inside the hole to see what I could see. I was excited by what I saw. The wall around the hole was about three and a half inches thick, three to five inches thick. It led into a tight passage. The passage had opened up a bit just inside the hole. It continued back about 10, 12 feet in a small crawl space. After that, it seemed to really open up. Although we couldn't tell, this could be a virgin passage. Obviously, no one has passed through this route, but there could be a way into the passage from the other side. To even get to the crawl space, we would have to enlarge the opening. Currently is about the size of my fist. We recommend our best plan would be to haul a cordless drill into the cave to drill into the rock. We could then take a bowl pin and a small sledgehammer and break up the rock. It seemed pretty straightforward. We would widen the hole big enough to squeeze and see what's on the other side. So, of course, a drawing was made to show you exactly what that cave could look like. So, of course, that would be Ted right there. And, of course, they named this Floyd's Tomb. So, of course, that was where the glove was going through, this little hole. And, of course, the entire point would be drill around it, break it with a sledgehammer, and then put this human body into this tight hole. Now, of course, that is the unknown area. Of course, the light can only go so far. Now, of course, I don't have to tell you this is a pretty dumb thing to be doing. Now, look, I get caving, and I understand all of it. But as a man that has some slight claustrophobia, there is no goddamn way that I'm entering into a hole that small. But, hey, I mean, really to each their own. I will say, though, in events of cave-ins or something... And, like, if, if you, let's say you actually went in all the way to here and there was something that happened, like, God forbid, and this whole section got blocked off, that is probably, without a doubt, the worst actual way to die. They literally even mentioned the why they called it Floyd's Tomb, which is literally, he got stuck in a tight crawl space and was unable to free himself. Calling our passage Tomb Floyd was not only a tribute to Floyd, but a commentary of the size of passage. So, of course, let's get into Work Begins. B and I were both excited to get back into the cave and get to work. I figured with about four hours of work, we could be in and see what was on the other side. We had arranged to borrow a DeWalt cordless drill to bring with us. So, of course, for anybody wondering what that was, I'll show you guys exactly what they're talking about. In terms of it, they're just talking about power tools over here. Obviously, to just break up just enough so they could actually start breaking down with the sledges. So, of course, that's they're just bringing basic power tools into the situation. So, after an hour of exhausting work, we could tell that we were not only going to get through in one second, Session, we kept trading off after we worked ourselves into a sweat. One would take a break and get some food and water while the other would go back to work. The routine was basically like that. We begin work, we have to get down on our knees and do our best to avoid smacking our heads on the ceiling. Working in the awkward position, we would drill into the wall around the hole. That was difficult work. We had to push on the drill, and it was slow progress. Then we inserted the bullpen into the hole and hammered on it until the rock broke. Then we would repeat the process. To give you an idea of how slow it went, the typical size rock that would break off was about fingernail size. If we broke off a larger piece, about one third of the size of my palm, it was caused for a celebration. So, of course, very small. Now, of course, what they showed was after their first trip, that was about the opening right there. So, of course, ladies and gentlemen, it went from just sticking a glove into to barely putting your head through. And, of course, when you're caving, you have very, very, very tight corners to deal with. So, this is about it. This is probably some of the best they're ever going to do. So, once they got down a little further, he details how the cave splits into four routes. The two passages are, are dead ends to the immediate left of the caver. Straight ahead and to the right are the passages that lead to pools of water. The entrance on the passage on the right is the largest of the four. The arched opening rises nearly 10 feet in the air, ending a mere, 10 ending a mere foot below the cave ceiling. As the caver enters the passage, the ceiling gradually lowers until it is about 6 feet high. It continues at the same height for the 40 feet, and the passage travels in the continuous direction. So, of course, they're just kind of working and operating in total darkness, trying to extend this cave and get down. February 10, 2001. At this point, they actually bring a dog with them, Bee's Dog, and which they've taken caving before, and they actually bring this one into the cave at this point. As you can see, they've managed to come in, and they've got a little bit of leeway to kind of just work around with. Despite working in the dark of the night, we were able to rig up and get down there pretty quickly. We didn't take as many tools as last time, plus we left some in the hole so we wouldn't have to haul them out and back in again. I did manage to get two more batteries for the drill, for a total of four, and a few more masonry drill bits. Even with the dog, we made some good time getting down. Then something bizarre happened that I can't quite explain. 
The dog began exploring as soon as we let her off the rope. She was in dog heaven, sniffing and darting around our feet. She would run from one person to the other as we made our way back to the work site. At the point the cave splits into four passages, the dog seemed to run out of juice. She was stuck right by either B or me, and that seemed kind of odd. As we progressed further into the cave, she would only stay by B. She seemed edgy, like she saw something she didn't like. As we approached the short drop-off before the hole, she stopped and would only come further after we coaxed her. The hair on her back stood on end. Finally, we got within 20 feet of the hole, she began to whimper and hide behind B. The tail was between her legs, and she was cowering down on the ground. Strange. I have seen her square off with dogs twice her size, but now she acts as if she's seen Satan herself. So, of course, you know, when it comes to, like, paranormal stuff or really anything, dogs are just, like, a, are believed to have, like, a heightened sense, uh, if you will. And that's why, like, when dogs start freaking out, like, if a dog stares into the corner of this room, like, in the dead at 3 in the morning, it's probably going to freak a skeptical person like me out. Like, it's just not something normally that I've ever seen dogs do. So, of course, they keep drilling more and more and more, and eventually they get to the point where they could start fitting the head through. So, of course, you can see some of the progress at this point, too. The hole went from a glove, slightly bigger, and now we're at a point where, again, a head and maybe, maybe just the tip of a shoulder can fit through. So, March 3, 4... 2001 is where they title it Noises. It took us three weeks before we got back uh, to the mystery cave. Our attitudes have changed a bit since we first started the project. In the beginning, we looked at the whole thing as a fun adventure. Since the last trip out, we found ourselves taking a more serious approach. On the drive out this time, our conversation was a bit more subdued than before. Of course, obviously, given how the dog reacted last time, wasn't exactly something that I think they were, uh, I, I, I think, I think it became less cheerful. So at this point, to look at a tomb a little bit closer, you can see the sledgehammer to size. This is just enough for somebody to cross through, like an able-bodied person to start crawling in. Of course, that's about like seven to eight feet is what they're actually claiming in the uh, thing. That's as far back as the light is reaching. So you can imagine at this point, crawling along this, what actually reaches to the end? Who knows? But of course, let's see what let, let's see what these two actually did. So where the noise comes in is right here. I was kneeling down and working the drill slowly into the wall at the time. I had my earplugs in, my safety glasses on, and was lost in my own thoughts. Suddenly, over the squeal of the drill wearing down the rock, I heard a strange noise. It was loud. I could hear it over the noise of the drill. Even though I had the ears plugged in, I at first I thought it was a drill bit doing its job on the cave. It would frequently complain by screeching and whining as we forced it into the wall. But this was different. It took me several full seconds to comprehend that this was coming from inside the hole and not the bit. I stopped drilling and yanked my earplugs out just in time to hear the most terrible scream I have ever heard trail off and echo into the darkness of the cavern. And this person was wide-eyed at the hole. For several moments, I didn't move, nor did I breathe. I turned to look at B. Moments earlier, he had been lying on the rope back catching a nap. Now he was standing upright, mouth open, and with a look of concern on his face. I turned and looked into the hole again, half expecting to see a demon face staring right back at me. Nothing was different in Floyd's tomb. So, of course, obviously, they're hearing screams. Now, at this point, yeah, it could be a demon, I'm sure, if you wanted to go the full supernatural route. Maybe, maybe somebody might have actually been into this cave and is stuck down there and they're screaming for it. But if that was the case... They'd probably be screaming beyond just, they'd probably be actually screaming out words just to ask for help. But, you know, the way that sound works and sound travels, I don't know necessarily if this could have been the drill bit, maybe some weird echoing going on. But the point is they heard a scream, a blood curdling one. So again, there's two creepy things that have happened. This scream and the dog acting like super weird about it. So of course, February 13th, they opened up the hole just a little bit more over here. So again, they're doing some solid progress. Not enough to completely fit through, but they'll get there in time. So of course, at this point, you can start to see the hole has extended to the point where he can get at least the upper torso through with minor scraping around the arms. Uh, and of course, you know, it still needs to be enlarged a little bit to get the rest of the body inside there. So of course, my journey into the tomb went like this. After I twisted my hips into the passage, I took a few minutes to stop and work out a game plan. Most of the length of my legs were still outside the entrance. They were just dangling in the air. The tomb was still big enough to move my head around and even move my arms freely into position. It was larger than the rest of the passage, but not by much. It was like sticking your head into a box. Everywhere I looked, there were rocks, and not too far from my head. Any sound I made was muffled and dead. 
The narrowest, narrowest part of the passage is about 10 feet in. At this point, I was about three and a half feet in. At about the four foot mark, I would have to commit to whatever position I felt comfortable in and stay that way until the 13 or sorry, 12 foot mark, at which time the cave started opening up. So, of course, it seems like the deeper they went in, the, the wider it started to become. So, of course, the final piece was when he started crawling in. Again, this feels a lot like that Metal Gear Solid 3 section after you fought, like, the pain. I think, no, sorry, the fear or the pain, one of them. And I think it's the pain, the 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 the, the bee boss. And you're basically, like, crawling around the cave for a bit. This is what it actually really does feel like. So, yeah, I mean, in a narrow space like that... He's got his whole body in there. Anything could actually happen. Who knows if there's some weird undocumented animal living in the background that could like just start eating your face off. I mean, this is one of those things where I don't understand it. I mean, again, to each their own, but I'm looking at this and thinking just why. And of course, the infamous image everybody knows is this one of him in Floyd's tomb. So again, this is our character moving on through and through and through, and you can really see there's not much maneuverability going on. Like, the head at this point is pretty much stuck where it has to be. And it, there's like one side of his torso is moving up, and the other side is just constricted. So again, if you get stuck in here and there's something that happens in the back, this is how you die. This is the exact, like, this is your death position that you're already in. April 7, 2001. So, of course, first thing, here's a picture of B with the pipe we made. I took a picture facing away from the tomb. He is sitting on the rope bag that we used as a bed. So, of course, here's B sitting around into the cave. And, of course, this is where they're succeeding. Okay, at this point, their cave adventure was a bit of a success. I took an oath. I made a vow. I would not leave the cave until I made it through the passage, conquered Floyd's tomb. This would be the trip. It had been a long time since we had been out to mystery. We had been busy, though. We had made the tools we had talked about. It was fun coming up with the ideas for the tools. Also, we made a squeeze box to determine the best technique for getting through the tight spot. Plus, we knew about how much rock we needed to remove before we could get through. We were excited to back out of the cave to finish our project. Our climb down to the passage took a little bit longer than usual since we had extra tools to carry. Once we got down to the pack passage, we immediately got to work using B's scraping tool. So again, they show the first section of the passage almost laying down. And of course, it really did start to just open up over here. We got the feetsies and that dark corridor that we're about to get into. I asked B how far he thought I should venture into the new cave in light of the strange events that had occurred, the screaming. The dog we weirded out. For the first time, he too toned down his enthusiasm as he remembered the noises. He slid the pipe through the tomb with a loosened tip on the end. He said I could use it as a weapon if I ran into an animal, or he also told me to make sure we could hear each other as I progressed through the cave. So, of course, they decided to go just a little bit into it, and they found some crystal formations. And, for instance, you can start to see, like, the crystal formations on the cave right over here as they're deeper into it. The passage continues on for another hundred feet or so before the cave opened up a little. It was at the end of the short straight segment of the cave. At the very end of the segment, the cave made a bend to the left and opened up into a room. Just to the point where the room began, there was a round rock that appeared to be leaning against the wall. This seemed odd, but singular formations are common in caves, so it is by no means unique. I had crawled and stepped over a large chunk of rock that fell down from the ceiling, but this one was more round than the others. Once past the rock, the room opened up into a height of about 15 feet. It was about 15 feet in width and about 30 feet in length. At the far end of the room, there was another passage leading straight out. As I entered the room, I had an eerie feeling. It was like the old saying that I felt like I was being watched, but again the excitement of the new find faded, and the memories of the mysterious side of the cave crept back into the mind. Suddenly, I felt very alone. Fortunately for my ego, I was nearly out of time and had to back out to B before my half hour was up. I took several pictures of the room. I was going to get a feel for how long the next passage was when something caught my attention. On the left side of the room on the wall, about eye level, I discovered what appeared to be hieroglyphics. It was a strange drawing that almost appeared to be just part of the rock coloration. It looked like very crude representation of people standing below a symbol. And at this point, they were like, obviously anybody's going to be pumped. It's like you discovered older civilization stuff. So here's the drawing in general. They saw this. And this is, as far as I can say, is what believed to be the Blair Witch situation. So if you don't know the Blair Witch, it's, it's, a, it's a story from, I believe it's like the Jersey Pine Barrens or like just 
just the eastern coast, if you will. Uh, basically, you go into the forest. If you watched the movie, you understand the Blair Witch is this character. You know, they, they go into the forest. They, they have the goddamn map, all right? They find these, like, little things hung up by trees, these little stick figures. And once you start seeing these trees, you're not getting out of the forest. The Blair Witch is hunting you down, and you're basically dead. So, of course, the last picture was this one right over here before they entered the room. Obviously, that room over there is the one where it's, like, 30 feet in length, 15 feet in height. So it's almost like they came across some like weird like home prayer room, if you will. April 14, 2001. A couple days elapsed before B found someone who wanted to explore the passage with us. B told me he talked to a few other people who couldn't make it because of scheduling conflicts. So they actually added a new person who's known as Joe. Joe B and I set out early in the morning to make sure we could spend all the time we wanted in the new page. Joe is a rather thin caver who had a lot of experience in caves. He said this might be the tightest squeeze he's been in, but it didn't bother him. He knew that physically he would be able to make it since I was bigger than him and I made it. He was just as excited as us to get through and get caving. Maybe more. I couldn't believe how easy Joe slipped through the passage, said it was tight, and it sure didn't look like it. I told him how far to go and how long it would take, and then I sent him on his way. Now, at this point, they sent Joe into the cave alone, and after a while, B went into the hole and started yelling for Joe. No answer. Not surprising. You can't just hear each other when you are that far apart in a cave, when you are very far apart. We nervously awaited any sounds. Good sounds, that is. Joe-type sounds. The 20 minute time limit we had set passed. Then 25 minutes, I had no idea, I had no desire to climb back through the squeeze. My head was still throbbing and the squeeze looked tighter than ever. Still, I knew I was going to have to make sure Joe was safe. Just as I was getting prepared to go back, though, I saw a light deep in the passage. Joe, I called out. Nothing. Joe, still no answer. The light got brighter and I could hear the noise of someone crawling across the broken rock that lined the cave. No, you okay, Joe? No, was his weak reply. Joe basically said no. Now, of course, they asked, you okay? And Joe was his very weak reply. When he got to the other side of the tomb, he said he was not feeling well. He quickly took his gear off and put them in the bag so we could pull it through. As I pulled the bag through the passage, he began to climb through the tomb. We had no chance to question about what we saw before he was coming through. He quickly sipped through the squeeze and the hole, and we finally got to look at him. He looked terrible. Face was pale, and he was completely out of breath. The dust that covers the floor of the squeeze left its mark on his face and clothes. He had numerous small cuts and scratches on his face and arm. So then they asked Joe, who didn't want to stay overnight because they felt terrible, they headed home, and they couldn't get any more information. He just straight stared ahead. He was shaking like a leaf, and he said he was too not cold. When we tried to question him, his answers were short. I asked him if he saw the hieroglyphics. No. Did you hear the yelling? No. Did you see the round rock? No. Did you see the crystals? No. Of course, Joe is completely a shaken up person. So, of course, on April 28, 2001, they actually contacted a local uh, cave rescue group, and they got permission to borrow a low-voltage two-way two phone. Now, of course, uh, of course, uh, our characters are doing relatively fine. They were rigging up the rope to descend into the cave, and I felt something for the first time. I did not want to go into the cave. It was not a feeling of foreboding. It was not some premonition. I just had no desire to enter the underground world of mystery cave. I didn't share this feeling with B at the time. Even though I had no desire to go into the cave, I knew we had to. Of course, that's probably your gut instinct, and if anything, you should listen to it. So, of course, at this point, they start to actually bring phones and even a video camera, where, uh, of course, ladies and gentlemen, obviously, you can imagine for a story like this, uh, we were not lucky enough to get any video footage for this event. But even if we did, it's clearly notable that even the small formations were just too small to show up on video. Again, to understand, ladies and gentlemen, this is something in 2001. Video technology, especially low-level, low-light video uh, technology, was not good enough to even be serviceable in a place like this. Of course, that's obviously assisting it with light. Of course, we weren't lucky enough to get any of that footage, and unfortunately, if we had that footage, maybe this might have added some extra realism. So, of course, as they were deeper into this passage, we got to the point where he didn't start hearing B until I reached the small area of the bottom of the drop. He was on rope and climbing out as fast as he could. I could hear him moving quickly and breathing heavily. So as they were progressing, eventually he heard scraping noises from behind them. It was loud, it was close, it was coming from the large room I had just left. I wheeled around to face whatever had made those noises. When I did, I lost my presence of mind and stood up at the same time. Crunch! My helmet crashed into the passage ceiling. My light broke and I was buried into a heavy darkness. 
pain shot through my neck and back down my back, or and down my into my back. The helmet had protected my head, but my neck was nearly numb from the impact. Fear enveloped me and my knees began to weaken. I slowly and involuntarily slumped up to my knees. I gently set the camera down as I began to see stars from the pain in my upper back. The scraping noise lasted only a second, and now the only sound I could hear was my own panic-inspired breathing. I was shaking violently as I sat there trying to figure out what to do. My mind was not thinking clearly. I honestly thought I was going to die right into the cave. And of course, he was wondering what B would ever do to figure out. And then he realized I had a phone. So at that point, he gets to the phone, all right, and at this point, makes out the call. I used the glow stick to light the phone reel with fumbling fingers. I managed to plug into the phone into the jack. I put the phone in my ear and heard nothing. The usual beeps to indicate connection with the other phone were not there. Terrified, I pulled the phone from the jack and reinserted it. Again, silence. The line was dead. What could have happened to it? I just talked to B. I found myself nearly sobbing with fear. I knew the only way out of here was back the way I came. Was something was there. A third attempt at making contact with B met with the same result. And then, of course, another plan had to be thought of. Forcing myself to move... I pulled my body onto all fours and started to progress along the cave. I still held the glow stick in my hand, but I had ceased checking behind me. Now my focus was ahead of me. I reached the point where I could yell to be, but I didn't make a sound. I didn't want to stop long enough to talk. Finally, I reached the last stretch of cave before the squeeze. As I was crawling towards the beginning of the tomb, I called to B. He answered back. I screamed to him to get everything ready to go. He asked if I was okay. Since he hadn't heard me on the phone, he had gotten worried. I told him no, and to get everything ready to go. When I reached the rope, I flipped off my helmet and shoved it into my pack. For the first time, I realized I had forgot the video camera. Yeah, that was a twist, ladies and gentlemen. The whole video camera was forgotten. Of course, you can understand in the middle of fear, clearly that can be a reality, right? Like, hey, the guy had to try getting out. Fuck the video camera. Life is more important. It was a fleeting thought. I cared no more about the camera than the passenger of the Titanic cared about the hat or a coat. I tied the pick to the rope and told him to pull through. Then I told him to start heading towards the surface as soon as he pulled the rope through. He asked why and I screamed that there was something in the cave with us. Just as I started into the squeeze, I felt the wind in the passage increase and with it the most nauseating stench I had ever experienced. Damp, rotting, rancid, putrid death. And I almost started to dry heave. This time, through the squeeze, I had no regards for the tightness of the passage. I was scraping my face, ears, arms, and shoulders. Every inch of the squeeze meant numerous scratches to my body, but I barely noticed them. My back was nearly paralyzing me with pain. Once again, I felt the rising need to vomit because of the odor being delivered into my nostrils by the breeze. Halfway through Floyd's tomb, I took a breath to catch I took a break to catch my breath. I was approaching exhaustion and my respiration rate was through the roof. So, of course, towards the end, uh, we had gotten to the top and uh, we had actually come free out of the whole, like, Floyd's tomb. So, of course, ladies and gentlemen, it's amazing how a person's state of mind can alter the perception of time. I'm sure it only took four or five seconds to sever the rope from the tree, but it seemed like an hour. When the rope was cut, the knot fell to the ground. While the end of the rope zipped across the rocks and over the edge of the cliff, the speed of it causing a humming noise as it went. As soon as the rope was cut, B let out a cry. He dropped the knife and fell backwards. Watching the rope fly over the edge brought the feelings in the passage back to me. I got up and headed towards the truck, and I noticed B was ly laying there, wide-eyed, staring at the point the rope disappeared. I called to him, which seemed to break his trance. He got up and hurried away from the tree. The cave, the nightmare. Neither of us said a word all the way home. And of course, the epilogue, which is the last page, 51901, is all the thoughts of our friend, Ted. Now, of course, that's where it all just pretty much ends. So nobody actually died in the scenario. Ted and B got away from the entire scenario. Now, of course, nobody died. Ted and B survived that entire ordeal. Although, you have to wonder what's actually down there. One of the beauties about this creepypasta is, again, the mystery of the unknown. Obviously, they heard screams. They, heard, they smelled putrid death. And, of course, the dog definitely has some supernatural feelings going down into the cave. Now, of course, to understand, even their friend, Joe, was traumatized from this entire situation and was very quiet coming back out of it. Clearly, whatever's in there could either be some demonic presence, could either be an actual animal that's actually out there to hunt you. Who knows? But the point is, Ted survived barely coming out of there. 
to the point where whatever Ted was going up against, he had no chance of winning down in its domain. Now, Ted the Caver is actually a completely real story from what we know. And the only actual interview that I could find with the actual original author, the actual Ted, was from a YouTube channel known as Nick Boda, currently sitting at 1.5 thousand subscribers. This whole interview has less than 10,000 views. And I figured one of the first original creepypastas definitely deserves more. So if you actually want to know about the thought process, the actual, you know, person behind the actual story, this is the interview you definitely want to check out. So yes, the true story of Ted the Caver, 100% true. Creepypasta history. And history indeed, because this story did become one of the original creepypastas that ever came out. And of course, to understand, this is a real story built out of Ted's actual caving journal as well, too. And of course, they discuss the movie that later got released on Amazon Prime uh, through streaming. And of course, the actual mentioning of the cave itself, which is located near Interstate 80, right near Windover, Utah. So let's actually look closer into this location itself. Of course, there's one video of the Tampanogos Cave by the National Park Service that sort of comes as the closest possible location for this place, for this actual location, for the Ted the Caver story. Again, is it real? Who knows? Because it's Mystery Cave and it was never actually dug into or detailed, we'll never actually know where Mystery Cave really was. Of course, in this case, we actually do. Because Ted the Caver is an amazing creepypasta and one of the original ones, it's been the draw of tons of internet sleuths all over. One of them is John's blog. Now, this is a post from September 17th, 2009. And what's important about it is John here actually goes out and looks into it and basically calls it the Interstate Cave or Freeway Cave. And is part of the Timpanogos Cave Network, which is in the Wasatch Mountains in the American Folk Canyon near American Folk, Utah. Now, of course, he actually does provide a map in this case, and we're going to look at that real quickly. Of course, accessing the map is not so easily, even if it's on a government site, because it doesn't exist. But because we have the actual URL, we can go back to the Wayback Machine and figure it out from there. Now, this downloads an interstate map PDF, which actually shows us profile view west. Now, this is the actual map that's been created. Now, it's scaled from 0 feet to 200 feet. What's important about this is you can see the interstate cave right here. But if we actually zoom closer to Gypsum Passage, you can see that this is where Floyd's tomb begins. So it's an actual location provided by the actual government sites right over here. So Floyd's tomb, and this is actually a real place. And of course, you can see DeWalt's Dig, which DeWalt's Dig is actually referenced in the story when they actually mention the DeWalt drilling machines that we saw earlier. But of course, what's important is this is where the actual case spreads into four different locations. In fact, you can even see, according to the story, that there's water uh, lines out over here too. So this is actually a real location that one can actually go to. So that part of the story is completely real. And one of the other beautiful things about the internet is the amount of blogs that exist. So this is one from Utah Caves, all on blogspot.com. This is from the Interstate Caves, where you can see some photos of what they're exactly referring to. And some of these give some striking resemblances to the photos we saw from the Ted the Caver story. What really gets into it is the story of possible plagiarism. Now, being the first creepypasta that we found on the internet, it became a bit of a controversial story, and one that I don't really see talked about too much, where it seems like the Ted the Caver story could possibly be stolen from another author. Now, to understand the context behind this possible alleged plagiarism uh, claim that's been thrown around, you have to really go back in time and realize this is a story with no ending, a cliffhanger. And of course, like all cliffhangers, people try to look for the ending. They try to look for an extra page out of this journal. Now, if you look at the actual scenario here, there were a couple posts all the way back in the early 2010s uh, on multiple forum posts, on multiple forum pages that one could find all related to Ted the Caver. One of them was on AboveTopSecret.com. And Above Top Secret is actually a site that we've seen from time to time on our deep web browsings. But of course, Ted the Caver, have you heard? This is a multi-page thread. And of course, what's important here is not only mentioning of Ted the Caver, which is from the original user here, Journey. This is a good one. If this is fiction, he has wild imagination. Photos are included in a story. He is a caver who has come across something very strange. On page four of this comes a user known as Anarchist. Now, Anarchist posts a bunch of different links to go hit up to. For instance, one of them is, if you want to see the supposed ending to the story, I haven't read it much, but it looks pretty fake to me. A lot more so than original story, still worth posting, though, is on gigdig.com. 
Now, of course, GigDig is a site that's pretty much as far as I've been able to see down. But because of the Wayback Machine, we have, in fact, a few archives. And this leads us to page 11. Dear Ted, Mark and I haven't heard from you in a long time, Ted. We looked up to some of your friends, and none of them seemed to know the location of Mystery Cave. After asking around and offering the description of the cave from notes you posted on your webpage, we finally found someone who knows of such a cave. He and Mark set out searching for you, B, and Joe. After navigation of the directions you gave of your webpage, they found a place that resembles the area that you and B had worked so hard at opening. And of course, this comes from Ted's sister, Jan. Ted, we don't know the password to your website, so we copied it to this free hosting service in hopes that if you're out there, you will find it and contact us. Now, of course, she gives this little uh, post over here, uh, this little link, which actually leads to a photograph. Now, this photograph, if you've been noticing, is the same photograph where the hand initially was sticking out of. Now, if you look even closer, you can see that this is very clearly photoshopped. You can do the same effect with yourself using the magic brush tool in any version of Photoshop. Now, of course, this leads us to page 12, which is actually the final page, the final finale. And, of course, a date from this is in 2004. We, have pr we are pretty sure that we found the wrong cave after seeing that the entrance that Ted and B worked so hard to open is merely a small crack. <coughs> Photoshop. But from the description of the cave and the limited photos that Ted had posted on his original cave page, not to mention the cool breeze blowing from the crack and the rock and the rumbling noises, I found another page on the web. And that one leads you to, believe it or not, Pedro the Mystery Mummy. Now, this is AnomaliesUnlimited.com, and what's interesting about this is the stories sound relatively, like, similar. You've got two characters, Cecil Maine and Frank Carr, spending weeks digging for gold in the San Pedro Mountains of Wyoming. And once they worked a rich vein, which seems to keep discontinuing into the rock, they decided to use dynamite to blast huge sections. Point is, they did find uh, one of these things, apparently, inside. Now, one of the things they found was this Pedro thing, which was a type of doll, I guess you could say, or a pieced-together work of taxidermy. And, of course, here's the, uh, here's the actual, like, x-ray image of it, so it's got, like, human bones or something within it. But, of course, this leads us down to another... People were trying to finish the story for quite a while. And, of course, Pedro is rather interesting in this case because when you go back to Ted's initial story around page 10, Ted actually does mention a creature known as the Hodog. The only story I could find in the cave folklore about the Hodog, the Hodog is supposedly a creature that roams caves. This is what they believe the screaming necessarily to be. Now, of course, if you look into what the Hodog actually is, this is a fearsome critter resembling a large bullhorned carnivore with thick, curved spines down its back. And it comes from the city of Rhinelander, Wisconsin. So, of course, if you actually look at what the Hodog is, this is what it looks close to. Now, of course, it looks incredibly similar to this Pedro creature right here. But, of course, this is where the rabbit hole completely ends. Because, ladies and gentlemen, the Hodog was not spotted anywhere near Utah, as far as I've been able to see, on every possible conspiracy page on the internet. But this should remind you that this story was worked on by numerous people because of its cliffhanger ending. But one of the actual cases of plagiarism led to a actual author known as Thomas Lara. So, of course, Thomas Lara is a new author in this entire mix that I never even knew of to this point. Now, this is a Wayback Machine post from a website known as liquidgel.net slash text slash terror.html. So, of course, this is the Terror of Huffman's Cave, where they actually basically copy the entire story almost word for word, it seems. Like, if you actually read through the story, you'll notice that there's plenty of moments where they talk about rotting, rancid flesh. I mean, if we even, like, type in the key cornerstones, like video camera, what about the video camera that I left behind? And, of course, if you just switch to the names about it, this would literally be the same goddamn story. I mean, they're literally even mentioning the masonry drill bits out and about. And, of course, the year is almost the same, 2001, 2002, just a little bit of variance. But, of course, it's almost the same exact story. Now, The Fear of Darkness by Thomas Lara actually is, as far as I've been able to look at it, pretty much word for word, up until, like, page 16, when the actual story is provided an ending. Now, the ending is not exactly, in my opinion, the best ending you could ever find. Uh, it does mention things like soul eating and Navajo tribes, for instance, even words such as Hindi, all right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I guess that might be a misspelling in this case because my language is not anywhere close to a soul leader, as far as I know, in other languages. But of course, what's really important over here is the copyright date of 1987 to 2004, implying, as far as I understand, that Thomas Lara may have written the story as far back as the 80s, sort of 
predilecting the technology of the later years, which, as far as this story is considered, isn't too far off the mark. Obviously, having a video camera in the late 2000s isn't necessary, or sorry, the early 2000s isn't necessarily as hard to believe. How good is this story? Not really that crazy for me, but, you know, let's go on. Now, when it comes to the topic of plagiarism, this actually led down to a longer investigation, and this one was spearheaded by a post in 2008 by a user known as Panama Jack on the Straight Dope Message Board. Now, of course, they first went to the Ted's Caving page, which is where we went to. Then, of course, they went to the Doug Austin Cave, which is exactly where we found the story. So the DougAustin.com, TL Caves, PDF, Fear of Darkness. So this is the page that we went to to read the story. Now, this is from 2005. Of course, going in further into the situation, they ended up finding out another website known as Liquid Gel, which I also showed in this video too. Of course, this one is from 2008, where of course you can read at the top of the description, I did not write the story, nor do I have explicit permission of its author, Thomas Lara, where they actually detail the author is Thomas Lara. In reality, Ted is Fred, it's a short story written by Thomas Lara in 1987, and they chose 2001 because they wanted to create a distant future where technology may not have changed significantly. Now, what had happened when looking up the registrant information of it, basically they found out through copyright notices and everything that eventually this all led from Panama Jack to a website regarding spaleology and horror story section regarding it. So the website here, spaleophilately.com, is not actually active at the moment. This is a dead website. It does not work anymore. Now, of course, spaleophilately.com leads us right over here. This is a website that was brought up into the Wayback Machine as far back as 2011. Of course, going into the contributor section for this page, going all the way down, we ended up finding Thomas Lara USA right over here. Of course, the image is exactly missing because it's on the Wayback Machine and we don't necessarily have everything available through these uh, caches. Now, of course, looking into the actual publication sections of this page, they ended up finding a page for Thomas Lara, thomaslara.com. Of course, looking into thomaslara.com over here, it actually linked all the way down to dougaustin.com slash toml. Now, of course, URL-wise, this is probably referencing a user, Thomas Lara in this case, such as toml, which is what I believe to be the shortened version. Now, of course, if we actually go back to the Wayback Machine, you can see the link is dougaustin.com slash PDF, the fear of darkness. So little suspect in this situation. Of course, even going further into it, what's really wild is looking into the actual publication. So, Bats and Philately, which is written by Thomas Lara. Now, of course, this person, apparently, throughout this investigation, was sort of referenced into John Rowland. I don't know exactly where this came into. It is from Panama Jack's investigation, but because a lot of these sites are dead, we really don't have too much of an idea regarding it. Um, unfortunately, that I couldn't dig up because of how dead some of these pages were. But we did find Ted the Caver's copyright, which was created in 2001. This is where we ended up finding out who the actual Ted was. And it's the same Ted that I believe was being interviewed by, by that same YouTuber I showed earlier on into this video. Now, we're going to return to John's blog to get the final word, really, regarding this entire story. So let's head on back. The story is true. I happen to be in his dog. All right, this is posted on the National Speleological Society Discussion Board on 11-25-04. And I've been in his cave for, uh, and I've been in this cave and through the hole after they opened it up. The passage continues on for over 140 feet, with a possibility of breaking into a side cave at the end. It was mainly walking passage after the initial tight crawl. The passage goes directly under the state, both directions and all four lanes. I suspect that what those weird odd sounds they heard were semis moaning over and probably at one time a tire screeching to a halt or something similar. Filtered through the bedrock, the sound can be distorted enough to have the otherworldly effect. I heard the booming and odd sounds, and it is, in my opinion, definitely the interstate traffic. So, of course, I guess they're trying to say the screams or weird noises were, in fact, uh, just traffic. The, the, the survey team and I did not know about the events until we were done with it. The survey team and I did not know about the events until after we were done with it, nor did we notice an odd Blair Witch type marking on any of the walls. It's one of the tightest crawls that I've ever been with. So, of course, at this point, they asked allegedly one of the authors, Ted themselves, about the actual story. I guess it's time to add my two cents into the thing. I'm the original author. I created the story on my own and copied no one. I will explain the details of the creation of the story in a moment, but first let me say, wow, I am still thrilled and amazed by all the discussion that my story has generated. I was unaware of just how far the story had circulated until Yvonne contacted me a few weeks ago. 
and I was aware of how many people had visited my website, the Angel Fire site, because of the counter on the site. I want to thank everyone who took the time to read the story, and I hope you enjoyed it. It took a long time to write, and even though there were a few things I would change, I am happy with how it turned out. The recent events leading up to this post are as follows. I was contacted by my friend Brad, the B in the story, a few weeks ago concerning an email he received from Yvonne. He mentioned that Yvonne was seeking the author of the Cavertet story in order to obtain permission to translate into French. I gave him my approval to pass along my name, email, and phone number to her. I began by giving everyone an outline of the creation of my story. Most of the following is what I wrote to Yvonne. So of course he's going to discuss how the proof of authorship belongs to them. Between 1999 December and February of 2000, Brad and I worked on a passage on Freeway Crave. We made numerous trips and spent many hours of hard work before we were finally able to get through the opening and into the new section of Cave. During the course of our adventure, I kept a caving journal and documented our activities surrounding our attempts to be the first people to enter this new passage. Since we were giving friends and family members updates as we worked, I thought it would be a good idea to put my entire journal up on the webpage. So, of course, I thought that occurred to me it would be fun to embellish the story a little. From there, it was a short leap to simply creating a work of fiction based on our experience. I felt like the internet was a perfect medium for my idea, and that's what I set out to do. For the next year, I worked on my story, off and on. Sometime in April 2001, I posted the first few pages. After that, I added them as if it was happening in real time. To summarize the fact versus fiction discussion about the story, let me say the parts about the digging and passage through Floyd's tomb are for the most part true and taken out of my caving journal. I intentionally altered a few details of the cave, but as has been mentioned, it is accurately described for Freeway Cave, Floyd's tomb, and the passage known as Gypsum Passage on the map. So again, what he's referring to is this gypsum passage right here. Of course, this like little narrow area. So that's Floyd's tomb. And of course, it opens up into DeWalt's dig. The supernatural aspects of the story are all fabrication, pure. Even the rumbling that both Dale Green and Rolf Powers mentioned exist in the cave did not inspire the story. So again, no supernatural. The dog was not spooked. There was no demonic presence. We all just got played. What I learned about the discussion on the forum, I did some digging and found other sites discussing the story. As I read all the different comments about the story, I was greeting at the variety of opinions expressed. Some people liked it, some thought it was long and boring, some thought it was creepy, some thought it was too far-fetched. The negative comments don't bother me. That's life. Although I will not likely, at least not immediately, post on other forums, it is defi- I will definitely defend my story on this one, since it involves caves and caving. I would like to begin with the most obvious evidence, the cave itself. It is clear to anyone who has been in the cave that the story accurately describes Freeway Cave. Even using the map, a guide, one can see the description resembles the cave, which are the odds someone would have written such an accurate description without seeing the cave. Obviously, yeah, when you look at the map over here, it does in fact open up, and it does in fact lead to multiple pads. And of course, those pads do have water at some point, and you can see according to this map that there would be some areas that would serve as rooms, if you will. Obviously, supernatural stuff is faked, but the description of the actual mapping was not. Now, did Thomas Lara see all this in a crystal ball and write about it accurately, or did somebody swipe my work? When the 1987 version surfaced, it took all of 15 seconds of reading to recognize it was definitely my story, with a few changes made. I figured I would read it and see if there was some way that I could prove he copied me. But it was difficult, since 99% of what he wrote was copied verbatim from my story. There's not much to go on. But I did find a few interesting things. Granted, this is a little more than circumstantial evidence, but it starts to add up, and I'll try to be brief. Isn't it an incredible coincidence that the story mentions a friend who likes to cave, was injured in the climbing accident, was told that he would never walk again, yet managed to beat the odds, and through hard work and determination, not only walks, but caves, though with some difficulty, and I have such a friend, his name is Brad, and the story is true. The dog we really took into the cave to check out the passage was real. I'll try to dig up a photo of him in the tomb. It was a Jack Russell. The Lara version switches to an Australian Shepherd. Hardly a dog to fit it in the tight squeeze. Absolutely true. On page 15 of the Lara version, he mentions the tools we invented and created. True story. For part one of evidence, I refer you to the photo of Brad. And of course, this is Brad right here. Uh, He is actually holding the tool. For the second part of the evidence, I humbly call upon Rolf Powers. On our last trip to the cave, we did not take the pipe wrenches that were necessary to dismantle the tool. Consequently, we left in the new passage. Rolf, when you mapped the passage, did you? When you mapped the passage, did you find the tool? Also, did you find a mini mag light? 
Now, of course, that was about the best evidence that we can ever actually imagine. Now, in a personal story, I don't actually believe this was plagiarized as well. Um, just because you copyright dated all the way back to 1987 doesn't necessarily prove that publication happened back in 1987. Anything that I found surfacing about that original post always happened in like 2004, 2005. So realistically, it's hard to tell if this was actually a plagiarized story. But why I deal and sort of like tend to go to Ted to Caver side is that you at least have photographs and you have a proper accurate mapping of the inside of that cave to some extent. Now, of course, I'm going to really end this video off where we're at. I'm about an hour in, and ladies and gentlemen, this is a, I guess you could say a summarization of one of the first internet creepypastas to ever really exist. And of course, one rabbit hole that I wanted to go down, not just because of the story, uh, it is open-ended, and unfortunately we're on a cliffhanger. Ted is not planning on finishing this anytime. Honestly, all interest in the story truly waned by all parties somewhere around 2005, maybe 2006. And while there were a couple posts around it later on, it never really went anywhere, and it just became known as a de facto OG internet creepypasta. Whether who wrote it first, who didn't, all the plagiarism and whatnot, I kind of deal a little bit towards Ted's side, simply due to the fact that Ted's got some of the photos and proper mapping that eerily is well, well on their side, okay, is all I'm going to say. But ladies and gentlemen, that was Ted the Caver, one of the weirder internet creepypastas and one story that definitely feeds off of the fear of the unknown. What happened down there? Well, in Ted's own word, that was a very embellished story. But let's assume that we never read Ted's explanation. Could it have been some demonic presence? Would you have went down into a cave like that on your own lonesome? I wouldn't. But ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am.